Good afternoon and welcome to the International Ocean Film Festival. My name is Anna Blanco and I'm the executive director. And it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome you to today's live streaming of our Q&A Dick Og Fisherman. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're in for a very delightful conversation today. Um, one thing I'd like to remind people is um, we're excited to have our very first virtual film festival. And um, it's created a lot of opportunities for us, including being able to host live stream Q and A's such as this one. Um, so until next August 9th, um, about a week from today, over 54 films will be available for viewing as well as the additional Q and A's that we have lined up. So please visit our website and look at more films and register to watch more of the Q and A's. Um, for us at the film festival, you know, our goal is to um, create a platform for conversation and to showcase films that tell stories about the ocean. Our mission is to save our oceans one film at a time. And I believe this film is probably one of our best examples of, of, of our mission and what we're doing and how each and every one of us can do something special to help save our oceans. What I'd like to do today is um, show the film and um, have everyone watch the film and then we'll come back and I will introduce our moderator who will then introduce uh, the rest of our panelists. So without further ado, Let's take a few minutes and watch the film Dick Og Fisherman. When you were fishing for albacore and we're way offshore and you can't see land, it's probably the most pleasant feeling that I can that I can express. I feel like I communicate with the water. I feel like it's part of my soul. I was about eight years old when we moved here to Sonoma County. And I started diving and once I got into the ocean and was able to dive, that was the coolest thing of all. I can sail the water. This is my home. It's, it's where I love to be. And I, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I just like to fish so much that, you know, I said, this is something I can do and provide a good, organic, sustainable product to people and make a fairly good living at. Initially, it started out just me. And I was just doing everything pretty much by myself until I started crabbing. And once I started crabbing, then you needed crew members. These guys that work on this boat and any of the crab boats that are out here put in some horrendous hours. And I mean, it's constant work and they're fantastic. <laughs> The boys are asking for their paycheck. I can't believe it. I can't believe you guys want to check. This is an exact duplicate of our pot. So when we get ready to set the gear, we take the buoys out and we throw them out the outside of the boat. This trails behind, just like this. And inside here, we hook two little bait cups. We lock the lid down and we just throw the pot over and off we go. This year, I had more whales around me than I've ever had before. I'm driving the boat and I look over and I see this whale and he's timing me right beside me, same movement. I watched him turn and I could see his big eye. <laughs> you know, I was going like, Wow, this is really neat. And he goes by me and then all of a sudden, I went to pull up the next pot, which means you have to slow down a little bit. And he goes, whoop, pulls in front of me, took off and went over and got the anchovies. My thought was, he's watching me and timing me so that he's sure he can get in between the boat and the buoys because he knows those buoys are there. 
you know, I just want you to know it's like this in Bodega Bay all the time. We always have weather like this, right? <laughs> in my lifetime, I have seen a significant change in the ocean. This time of year, in February, when I used to dive all the time, the water would be so cold that it would burn your skin. You could hardly get a breath. Now it's 54, 55 degrees. The rich, cold water that comes from the depths isn't able to reach the surface and cause the krill to grow. The other thing is that the concentration of domoic acid seems to be increasing. And what we've seen is more algae blooms in and around the river inlets. These changes that I've seen affect the crab season. 2015-16 season was delayed by domoic acid, yet fishermen starving, waiting to get out, make some money. It was the perfect storm. You had no krill, so the whales couldn't feed on krill offshore. So they all focused on going along the shoreline. You had extremely warm water, which pushed all the anchovies and herring into the bay. Their feeding habits are different when they feed on what we call hard bait or anchovies and herring because they flip their tails and they get very active. And then the season started. Unfortunately, a number of whales got entangled that year. Back up, back up, back up. Get the boat fully ready to go over. Okay, fully over, fully over. I think everything came off, maybe. That was when the Dungeness Crab Gear Working Group came together and we began to look at ways to mitigate these issues that we were having. Since that time, I do a lot of testing for the state, you know, not only demoic acid, but also gear innovations. There are other gear types that get tangled up with the whales, but the Dungeness Gear industry has taken all these things into account. We did a line profile where we put sensors on the lines from the crab pot all the way up to the buoy to figure out what configuration works the best to keep the line as straight as we can so that there aren't these loops that potentially a creature could swim through and get caught in. I've also volunteered to help NOAA's aerial surveys so that we understand where the crab pots are and where the whales are. I think that fishermen in general are conservationists. I think we are the true custodians of the ocean. Give me some of that rope. Push it in a little bit. Okay, let me see if I can squeeze it. There's less bycatch with crabbing than there is in just about any fishery. It's almost one of the cleanest fisheries that you can think of. Crab fishing especially doesn't ghost fish. This is called the cotton, and it actually breaks down over time. So if I lose this pot, that cotton will break, and the lid opens up, and the crabs get out. I understand that each year, on average, about 10% of the crab pots are lost uh, following storms. By retrieving these pots, you know, and getting them out of the water, that's just one less vertical line that, you know, potentially a creature could swim through and get caught in. What has happened now is that the state of California has implemented a pot retrieval program and each port is going to be given a permit to allow the individual boats to go out and collect the gear. I'm really interested in that. I want to make sure that we continue to do everything we can to try and keep whales from being entangled. Are we going to be regulated because there's whales in an area? Probably so. That's what the crab fishermen are worried about. You know, how the regulations are going to impact us. Fishing's one of the oldest industries there are been around forever and I don't want to see it go away. 
I don't want to see the younger generation not have an opportunity to continue that. I would hate to see that happen. The ocean is life to me. And I try to take care of it, you know, because it takes care of me. Right, Buster? So Cynthia, the only person that needs to be unmuted. So, she's... so thank you everyone. Thank you for um, such a lovely film. And thank you, Cynthia. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the film. Um, one of our board members, our esteemed board member of board of directors of the International Ocean Film Festival, Brian Baird. Um, Brian is also the president of the Coastal States Stewardship Foundation and is the former California Assistant Secretary for Ocean and Coastal Policy. Um, so thank you, Brian, for hosting us today. And um, one thing I would like to point out is that this film is the recipient of our 2020 IOFF Short Film Award. So congratulations to Cynthia. And um, it's my first chance to say congratulations. So uh, we look forward to giving you your award in person. So without further ado, Dave, um, Brian, do you wanna go ahead and uh, take it over? I'll do that. Well, thank you, Anna. Um, good afternoon. And uh, thanks to all of the uh, viewers who are joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, I am Brian Baird, and I'm the moderator of this session with the film Dick Og Fisherman about fishing and ocean protection and, and so many things that we care so much about off our coast. I'm going to make introductions in just a minute. I just first wanted to say how much I personally enjoyed this film. I've been doing this work for over 40 years, and so much of it has been regulation and, and uh, uh, planning and all the sorts of things that I had to do as assistant. Um, Secretary, but I became a member of this International uh, Ocean Film Festival board because I love the intersection of, of science and art and passion and public policy. I think all those things are necessary to, to make change. And I believe Cynthia hit those points in, the, in this film. Uh, this film really provided a bird's eye view for what it's like to be a commercial fisherman. And I've been on Dick's boat and it, it felt like watching this film, I was on his boat. Uh, it informs uh, viewers of the in environmental issues and what it's like to be a, a commercial fisherman. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, with regard to that, that these things, uh, the, everything that Dick talked about requires uh, solutions on the part of fishermen and regulators and academics and the community. I think that that came out. Um, I like the ending of the film, which provided uh, clear messages on sustainability and basically said it's all of us. And I think those are messages which we constantly tried to convey uh, from Sacramento. 
Uh, and as Anna said, I think this is a great example <clears throat> of our tagline for the film festival that we're trying to save the ocean one film at a time. And I think this is just one more film that advances that goal. So uh, we have a wonderful panel this afternoon. Let me uh, get to it. Uh, so Cynthia Abbott uh, is an independent film producer who created this film. And it's pretty clear to me when I watch this that she believes in the power of storytelling and how a film can, can change our collective vision of the ocean. She produces films on environmental issues to raise awareness. But what's really important is she's looking to move people to action. And that's what we want to see. She views film as a way to, to create a new vision for the ocean future and to protect it and help it thrive. Uh, Cynthia has been all over the world with her work. She's been as far as Burma and Thailand, but she makes it as an adult. She has lived uh, along the ocean in both California and Hawaii. So welcome, Cynthia. Then uh, on to David McGuire, who I've known for several years. Uh, David is the founder of Shark Stewards, a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to ocean health and shark protection and stewardship. David and I started and co-chaired the Golden Gate Marine Protected Area Collaborative here in the Bay Area, Marin and San Francisco counties. It's one of 14 such organizations uh, around the uh, coast of California dealing with trying to make marine protected areas happen. David is kind of a unique guy. He's a biologist and a boat captain and a dive master and a writer and an underwater cinematographer. And he's got a lot of, of uh, awards and other things to his credit. He's a professor, an adjunct professor at the University of California and an associate with the Academy of Sciences. He's also in the water and uh, he's done the Hawaiian Ironman. He's open water swimmer. And he always likes to say that he swims for sharks. So. So uh, uh, finally, David sponsored and served as uh, one of the driving forces for the Shark Conservation Act, which was going through when I was assistant secretary. And it was a very important law that, that prohibits the possession and sale of shark fins in California. So David, thank you very much for, for being here today. Thanks, great to be aboard with you all. And finally to Dick Ogg. So Dick is, is, is just a, a wonderful person and it's because of Dick that I decided that I wanted to be the moderator of this panel. He has been a commercial uh, fisherman or is a commercial fisherman and has been in uh, Sonoma County since he was in the, the fourth grade. I, I love looking at uh, your, his bio that he learned to fish with his visits with his grandfather, a member of the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma. He came late to the commercial fishing industry. Uh, for three and a half decades, he was an electrician at Sonoma State University. And he also had a little, uh, a short stint uh, in martial arts where he had a martial arts studio. These are things I, I didn't really know when I first met him. But uh, in one form or another, he's always been a fisherman. He's also a diver. You saw his, his boat, the Karen, uh, Karen Jean, uh, which he bought in 2013. Uh, and uh, you saw his, his dog, uh, Buster, there's also Nessie. Oh, I saw both. I think both uh, dogs were in the film. He is trying, Dick is, is unique in that he really is trying to, uh, to work out solutions to issues, to problems. He, he's on the, the California Dungeness uh, Crab Fisheries uh, Working Group. He's a member of the Fishermen's Association in Bodega Bay. And I think very importantly, he's a member of the Sonoma Coast Marine Protected Area Collaborative, which is the collaborative just to the north of the one that David now co-chairs uh, with another individual. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and it should come, it's no surprise he's a proponent for doing the right thing. And I've seen it in action. So it should come as no surprise, Dick continues to love fishing. And, and I think as he stated, he wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. So thank you so much, Dick, for being here today. Thank you. So on to our session. Um, today, we're gonna to discuss this film and commercial fishing and ocean protection. And I'm gonna start out with some questions, but for those of you who are watching, you have the opportunity to send in questions, which will be transmitted to me. And I'll try to ask them uh, for probably about, uh, in, in about uh, I don't know, a quarter of the hour. Uh, let's see here, and that's, that's that. Let's go to our first question, which is really for Cynthia and, and Dick, maybe Cynthia first. Um, I think this film is a wonderful tribute to Dick and to all responsible commercial fishermen and talking about all the issues that they face, and we all face with the ocean. Um, it highlights some of the pressing uh, environmental and operational issues that are, are, are faced, uh, which I think is really important. But what gave you the idea for the film, Cynthia, and how did you connect with Dick and how did you make this, this whole thing happen? 
Uh, well, the Dick Ogg piece is in a series of films that myself and co-producer Andrea Leland are making. And it's for the Every Second Breath project. And our goal with Every Second Breath is to make short films that um, highlight and profile sort of extraordinary everyday people who are taking actions to um, preserve and heal the ocean, which is in crisis right now. Uh, so we were looking for our next subject and I heard about Dick and his involvement with the Crab Pot Retrieval Program. And I was intrigued. I was fascinated about this program. So um, I called him on the phone and we met on his boat and we started a conversation about his work and his um, activism towards uh, the retrieval program, his work with the state, federal, and uh, fishing community for advocacy towards uh, healthier fishing. And I immediately knew within five minutes, I want to profile Dick. He was engaging, he had wonderful stories, and he has that passion and connection for the ocean that is so sincere. And I knew he had a good story to tell. And thank you for um, your comments on the film because it's everything, we, it's, that's the message we wanted to get across. Everything you, you, you got all the key points. So I don't have to say them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm glad it was so clear. It was. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. saving the ocean one film at a time. We're saving the ocean one story at a time. And Dick is a perfect example of a person that can, wherever you are, whatever you do, you can take action towards a healthier ocean. And he does that. And it's reflected in his story and, and the film. So Dick, what was it like having a film made about you? How, how <laughs> <laughs> uh, realistically, I'm speechless, you know, um, working with Cynthia and, and the film crew, you know, uh, was extremely special, um, you know, to, to just to, to have the opportunity to kind of express some of the differences that, uh, you know, we as fishermen actually have and help the public understand that, you know, we're, we're really here to provide a, a, you know, a sustainable organic product to the public in the best way that we can. And, and our objective, you know, be able to continue that without, you know, impacting and causing issues that, you know, would damage or, you know, reduce the opportunity for us to fish. I mean, the fishermen themselves are, are very conscious of that and are trying extremely hard. And it's, it's sometimes uh, a little, um, uh, it's, it, it's difficult for me because there are so many people that do the right thing out here. And so many, you know, fishermen that are, working hard to do the same thing. I, I, I just, I, I wish everybody could be, you know, uh, I wish everybody knew how, how much all these guys are trying to make this work. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be representing, you know, uh, some of these issues and some of the things we're trying to work on. So thank you again. Sure. And Cynthia, uh, I might want to just mention the, I think the other two films that are in your series and then what's next? Is there, is there another segment coming or? Um, there is, but first I'd like to give a call out to our production team, um, Fabian Aguera, and he's the director of photography and Maya Pashoda, who is an incredible editor and a second camera and the film quality could not have been made without their incredible talents. So I just want to acknowledge their, their work. Um, we have two other films. Well, we're putting together a package of three films that we're going to edit together and put them into the educational market with study guides, because there's a lot of information in here that could educate children. Um, and so the other one is on a, Mike, um, Mark Nolan, who is an educator and musician and who teaches children about the tide pools as a, a program, a summer camp program 
uh, in San Mateo. Um, and he has a delightful story and he's a delightful personality. And we are in post-production right now, working with a uh, plastics artist. And she creates these incredible portraits from large pieces of plastic that have been found on the, her local beach, in Stinson Beach. So what's next? We had started to make a documentary. We saw, uh, after creating this short for Dick, we could see there was a very deep story there. Um, the effects of climate change and everything that's happening in our now uh, would be a wonderful story to follow, a very interesting in-depth story to follow. And that we felt that it would be a story that people across the United States and possibly the world could relate to. Um, the changes that are taking place, the adaptation that we have to partake in, and things aren't staying the same as is reflected in the film. Things are changing and we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. So we had done quite a bit of footage on Dick and um, then COVID-19 started and we had to stop production. And it's on hold for who knows how long. It's so unpredictable what's happening next. Well, it's a crazy time. And I'm going to follow up on that in, actually in a minute. Um, let me move to, to David. You know, David, you wear so many hats in, in, with regard to the oceans. And, and I can consider you a scientist. And I really consider you an activist and a filmmaker and a, somebody who, who's also kind of a storyteller. Um, and uh, most recently, you know, I worked with you. We, we started the, the Marine Protected Area. Um, uh, collaborative uh, for the Golden Gate. Uh, and it, that really relied on community-based solutions. It relied on getting people like Dick together with academics, with enforcement people, with with all the, the community. And and could you talk a little bit about the importance of, of that community structure for, for making all of this work? Because I think, I think there's sort of been, unfortunately, I think our whole political system is going to kind of a black and white, good guy, bad guy thing. And I think the environmental movement has had that from time to time. What do you think about the whole community-based approach? Well, I think it's critical for success in any endeavor, but particularly when it comes to the ocean, which is 71% of their planet. You know, we need everybody involved. And it's really encouraging to have someone like Dick who knows the ocean, who works on the ocean. He knows how hard it is to work on the ocean and dangerous and providing a sustainable source of food to people who quite often don't know what they're getting, where they're getting, or how hard it takes to get it, and how it gets to them. Um, so it was a great film, a great message, Cynthia. And, and you neglected to say, Cynthia, that you also had every second breath, the, sh the short that showed in the San Francisco Ocean Film Festival right. three years ago, I think. No, it was last year. <laughs> it was the last year. Well, it seems like three years ago with COVID, I think. Oh, yeah. um, how much? A really nice short uh, and. Uh, if anybody gets a chance to see that, I'm sure that's online somewhere. Um, but I, going back to the community and, and maybe even the storytelling thing, you know, we all have a story to tell and we all have a, a role to play and some of us more than others in the ocean. Uh, like Dick, I've been very close to it most of my life and including as a commercial fisherman, Brian at UCSB, uh, when I was uh, put myself through school as an urchin diver going out to Santa Cruz Island. And it's really hard work, <laughs> but it pays well. But I stopped when I came up to Berkeley and Ron Elliott though is still going out strong out there. I saw him diving. Uh, he can't fish though now because it's a marine reserve out at the Farallons. But going back to the whole Marine Life Protection Act, as you know, and we talked about it in our webinar, um, there's been a real history of marine protection that dates way back uh, 1900 uh, in California. And creating these protected areas that were kind of disparate, postage stamp, managed in different ways. And so under the Marine Life Protection Act of 1999, it actually really came together. And it was a stakeholder driven process that included scientists, academics, legislators, regulators, uh, but it also included the community, including fishermen, commercial and recreational. And they had a large voice and role in drawing these lines in these marine protected areas, which are now 124 strong in our coastline, integrated in this ecosystem-based management approach. And I was involved in the central coast, and I'll tell you, it wasn't all fun and games and as part of the stakeholder process. There was 
as Dick probably remembers as a stakeholder, there was a lot of arguing and arm wrestling uh, across the lines on who, where to protect the best rock or where to leave the rest, the best rock open for fishing. Uh, but we got through it and now there's strong evidence that it's working. And so now with our collaborative process uh, here in the Golden Gate where we actually had two counties, uh, but also we work with the other 13, as you said, including very closely with Sonoma, which starts at Bodega, where, where Dick's boat is, and then all the way up to Point Arena. And I think there's like 25 or 26 in that collaborative marine protected areas that are mm -hmm. include no take or conservation areas or special closures. So it's an experiment and process, but it, I think what the fun is, is actually working with people of all walks of life. So you're not just dealing with Ivory Tower, you're not just dealing with the suits in Sacramento, uh, you know, you get out on the water, right? We have meetings that are really close to the water. We, we had Roger Thomas in our collaborative, unfortunately passed away, but another great spokesman uh, and around the Salmon uh, Fishing Association and a good friend of mine. And we went out and used his boat whale watching and shark watching and teaching kids and the public about the ocean. So it's, it's really amazing that how much information, how much history that these fishermen have. And I really do believe they need to be respected. And I think this is one really great way to honor and respect them through films like this at our Ocean Film Festival. They're here, they're here. I wanna kind of move to just the whole sustainable fishing. And, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's, it's a very strange time for all of us, uh, which hopefully will be an ephemeral thing. Hopefully in a year or two, we're gonna be through this, but climate change is, is gonna continue. And, and, and the film, I think, <laughs> great job of, of kind of simply talking about the changes in temperature and the movement of, of bait fish or whatever you want to call them inshore bringing whales in and all these these different kind of factors um, but but dick you know what do you see as the biggest challenges for for sustainable uh, seafood production uh, given what what's going on right now uh, I mean it what, what's highest on your kind of radar screen um, in terms of challenges, Brian, is that what sure. you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I think right now with the COVID, <laughs> thing, you know, the most difficult situation we have is getting the product to the public, um, you know, to the restaurants and, and allowing them to be able to, you know, utilize what we, what we can provide. Um, what, what's interesting to see is that um, in general, I have to say that the ocean uh, is kind of gone back to its normality. I mean, we've got we've got good cold water, we've got a lot of upwelling, we're seeing a lot of kill pro uh, krill production. Uh, things look very good right now. Um, right at this right moment. now, yeah. right? You know, and again, you know, this uh, because everything's cyclical. You know, it's very difficult to be able to put your finger down and say this is what's going to happen in this particular time. But you know, in terms of you know, uh, our, our probably our, our right for the moment, getting our product to the public is the most difficult thing we have. You know, to have to deal with. You know, so you know, with a large influx of, of salmon as we have right now, you know, the the markets get flooded. We're not able to move the product the way we would normally and as a result you know the price drops uh the fishermen still do the same amount of work we spend the same amount of time on the water but you know our our price that we receive is not what it was a couple of weeks ago yet the consumer still pays the same amount so it's difficult for us as fishermen to see these kinds of things happen and not, not receive the benefit of, you know, what we feel we should be seeing. So, I mean, that's the biggest problem I see for the moment. I hope that answered the question. It does. And I'm kind of curious, any thoughts by any of you and, you know, the next administration, what, what, what should the focus be? I mean, you know, have, 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 where have we gone in the past three years and where do we need to go? I mean, any, just, just sort of throw that out. I'd like someone else answer that poli oh, okay. the political well, question. <laughs> Sorry. I would just like to see all of the environmental uh, protection acts that have been chiseled away by the current administration reinstated immediately. 
and strengthened so that this kind of um, dismantling of things that are helping our environment can't be discarded with a sweep of a pen. So that's general answer, but I think that's where I'd like to, to see the beginning first step. And there's many, many more. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's, it's a little scary, you know, with the stroke of a pen very early on in the administration, we all worked for five to six years with the Pew Oceans Commission and the US Oceans Commission, uh, bipartisan experts from throughout the country. And with a stroke of a pen, the the ocean policy was stricken and take, taken away, and uh, that just killed those of us who worked so long on this. So, certainly hope that we're going to see a more science-based approach in the future, and and kind of you know regaining some of those uh, those those losses. Actually, um, let's see. I'm going to probably move here to second to some of the questions. I'm getting a few questions, but. First, Dick, just uh, just another one back back to you. Um, you went through this big transition from, from being an electrician in the you know in the university system in Sonoma mm -hmm. to commercial fishermen. And as you say, it was kind of a continuum. I think you did commercial fishing for a while while you were doing the work in the Sonoma State. But uh, can you talk about that transition and and the, and, and how it is? To, to be a fisherman. I mean, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, in, in reality, uh, you know, I've only been in the business for some, some 20 years, and uh, that's a drop in the bucket in comparison to a, a, a large quantity of the fishermen that are, you know, currently fishing. Their families have fished, their families before them have fished, and, um, you know, the, my transition was something that I did as as just a love for what I'm doing. I I mean, I really, I I really love what I'm doing. I mean, if I didn't, uh, I don't. I, I you know the 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 amount of work and energy that we put into this is just uh, it's it it's hard to explain. Even you know, I I, I just that that movement from being on you know uh, doing electrical work and helping people you know in their homes and you know uh, in the university and everything was fairly simple because it was something that I could sense that that was the direction I wanted to go and that's where I continued to go and then, you know the last I think eight years that we were at the university we were fishing pretty hard commercially and the nice thing about the way the state works is that it offered me the opportunity to take that time and, you know, do the fishing I needed to do when I needed to do it. And that, uh, that opened the door. I mean, I, I, I couldn't ask for more, you know, it just worked out very, very well. Thank you. And I've got actually, I'll go to the first question here uh, from Mary Jane. <clears throat> got one. Mary Jane. Uh, Dick, there's no magic bullet solution to entanglement. Uh, what do you see as the most promising direction for the dungeon? <laughs> well, we work on that on a daily basis, actually. And one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd like to bring to the attention of many people is that, you know, um, if we equate this to, to like car accidents on the freeway, I mean, we try to, I try to look at it kind of from that perspective. You know, the, you can you can put your seatbelt on, you can slow the people down, widen the road, drive with your lights on. You can do all of that, but there will always be accidents at one point or another. So entanglements are, is it something we can get down to zero? Probably not. But what we could do is we could find ways to minimize injury and find ways to minimize interaction. So you know, that's what we're trying to do right now is we're working on, on equipment and gear that will minimize injury and potentially minimize our interaction. Awareness, knowing where the whales are, where the, where the crab deer is going to be and removing it when we need to. I mean, all of that equates to, you know, less interaction. So we're really, really trying, and all of us are trying. Every fisherman out here knows and works to try to make it make it better all the time. Thank you. So Jill, I, or Cynthia rather, uh, this is from Jill. Um, 
uh, I think you've asked, really answered this. She says, out of, out of all the topics you could have chosen related to the ocean, what compelled you to hone in on dick og and crab fishing? Um, I think you sort of answered that, but if, you, if there's anything else you'd like to say. Um, no, I just thought he was a perfect example of the, the people we want to profile, that um, he's proactive in the issues that are taking place with the fisheries. And he's very de deeply connected and passionate about the ocean. And I think it was an important message for people to see a different story, uh, more of a personal story from the uh, fisherman's perspective, because so much of the news that we get is on entanglement and overfishing and unsustainability. And this is more of a portrayal of what it's like on the other side, on the fisherman's side. And I don't know if that story is told enough. So I, I liked his story and I liked uh, who he is and what he represents as a um, fisherman and what he's doing. <laughs> Great. So, so, so Dick, uh, I think we all know some of the community that deals with whale rescue and, and, and marine mammal rescue and so forth. You want to talk a little bit about what the involvement has been with the crab fishermen and the whale rescue operations up and down the coast and, and that, how all that, that works? Uh, or uh, is there a direct connection? Uh, or do, do you help technically? Um, and I honestly don't know the answer to that. So, okay. Um, uh, we, I don't know that there's any real direct. Uh, interaction with the whale rescue other than if we do see something typically we would you know we, we would notify we would notify the you know the whale rescue people um, uh, I mean I, I have been asked you know to help uh, go in fact this year it actually happened uh, Noah called in uh, NOAA Noah called and asked if I would be available to help, you know, transport some of their whale rescue people out to, um, you know, uh, help uh, a, dis a disentanglement that actually was on a buoy, a NOAA buoy that, they, that got, they, the whale got tangled on and they were able to disentangle it. And they did that on another vessel at the time I was fishing and I couldn't break away. But um, in terms of, over, you know, interaction, um, I, I, the, the fishermen are trying to work to, to reduce the interaction, but in terms of actually interacting with the, with the whale disentangling group, I don't know that there's really that much, you know, overall work together or just minor communication mainly. So really the, the involvement has been in, in ways to prevent and trying to come up with different line configurations and gear uh, operations prevent and then and then there's also I, I don't know if it's we discussed this explicitly uh, here today but the whole uh, pot retrieval uh, programs and maybe you want to mention that for a second uh, okay well the pot retrieval program has been in in in, in the it's been working for quite a few years a number of years up north in the northern counties um, or northern ports they've been retrieving pots for quite a few years. Uh, about five years ago, we brought it down here to Bodega Bay, and uh, that's kind of how Cynthia and I got to, obviously how Cynthia and I got together, was on the pot retrieval. She actually came out with me, I believe, and we did we did some pot retrieval and some demolic acid testing at the time. Um, but uh, that's something that we want to try to, you know, reduce as many of the lost pots as possible. The stray pots can be problematic only for, not only for the whales, but for the salmon fishermen. So, you know, our idea is to get as much of the trash out of the water as we possibly can and uh, reduce the, you know, lost gear that's left, you know, um, as much as we possibly can. Um, the, the, I lost my train of thought, but um, that that is something that, that we really emphasize. And, Half Moon Bay has been very uh, active in it. San Francisco has been very active in it. We're trying to do it here right this year as, as we have breaks in between our seasons. And so the guys are working really hard to get that gear back in. Cool. Uh, it, it, so thank you. 
and and I think you know the program is is a is a wonderful thing on all levels as far as I'm concerned because you're getting the, this material out of the ocean and and there's compensation I understand for the individuals to go retrieve them so it, it does make make sense yeah and I, I may have a question coming through but I'm going to ask David a, qu a question in the meantime David with the collaborative with with MPAs and and I I would say just the the, the very uh, strong resistance on the part of the fishing community at certain times, probably primarily the recreational fishing, I mean, more so than the commercial, but uh, where do you see that now? Uh, how are things, uh, are, are people working together a bit more now? And um, You know, it's interesting, as Dick said about COVID, I have friends who are commercial fishermen and friends who are recreational fishermen. And it seems like there's more fishing pressure recreationally now because people have time. We've been monitoring piers, primarily in Southern California for shark catch and looking at white shark catch on commercial piers, as well as threshers and a few other species. And we're seeing a lot more activity. It's definitely a lot more anglers, although there's fewer charter boat fleets because of social distancing. Um, you know, on the high seas, the word is coming out or in internationally, we're seeing poaching going on in our marine reserves. And there was just a paper that was out last week that showed uh, some of the global uh, fishing data, AIS, all of these Chinese boats that are encroaching on and in the Galapagos reserve. So it's, it, things have definitely changed on an international as well as a local scale. Um, you know, as far as resistance to the actual process, it, it, there are a few, fishing clubs that are very well organized, as you probably recall. There was a lot of people showing up in the same t-shirt doing Me Too and happened to be sponsored by Shimano and Evan Root and some of the fishing supply suppliers. Um, we, we, were getting, we were getting sued at the resource <laughs> agency by some of them. And they have a big voice and a very powerful lobby and actually professional lobbyists on staff. And it's kind of hard for a small nonprofit, you know, and they would kind of outlast us too, where it's like, got to go home and feed the kids or go to work tomorrow. And people are still in line saying basically the same thing since 10 o'clock. And, you know, the other side quite often didn't have as much of a chance to have a voice or weren't quite as unified. But I know a lot of fishermen who truly support it, particularly the guys that I work with. Uh, you know, we charter a boat that is a commercial vessel to take the public out to the Farallon Islands and at public education trips. And these guys are crabbers and we mark you know, the abandoned pots and try to turn that data over. Uh, before I end, I wanted to ask Dick a question, and probably you too, it's something relevant to that. But, um, you know, I, I think we're seeing a lot of support in our area, but there are the people who are against it who will always be against it. And then there are the people that we've worked with. Uh, I have a commercial salmon, salmon fisherman who I've charted his boat and used him. Really great guy, really great fisherman. And he's kind of ambivalent. He didn't embrace it, but he doesn't hate it. And, um, you know, others are just see, definitely seeing an increase in rockfish, especially outside the Farallons. And I know as a diver firsthand, anecdotally, we've been surveying MPAs uh, as a citizen science project. And right now with this <laughs> snapshot CalCoast through the California Academy of Sciences and the California Marine Protected Area Collaborative, and anybody can do this, tide pools in the marine reserves and add data on iNaturalist, but we've been doing it subtitly and I'll tell you what, we are seeing way more fish, way more lobsters. A lot of the fish, particularly in Southern California, like the sheep's head that were almost gone, are just abundant and big in the marine reserves and around them. And then the areas that are fish, not, not as much. And, and uh, so it definitely, and, and the data supports this coming out of Pisco and University of Santa Barbara, that the MPAs are working, the spillover effects working um, for the most part. And I think if that data gets out there, we'll probably see more support from these fishermen because it's gonna mean more fish for them. So we, that's our job as a collaborative network and a state network is to communicate that, right? Agreed. <laughs> but I had a question, because um, we do mark these pots and I see some of the same ones when we go out to the Farallons. And there was a program, I remember you did something, Brian, you chaired it with the Bay Institute on, on this whole issue of abandoned fishing gear. And I know the state uh, Fish and Wildlife had a program on, uh, the, there was a bounty on retrieving uh, 
abandoned pots. Is that still going on, do you know, or? Well, I think that's kind of what we were referring to a bit before. Yeah, yeah is it still I, going? Would you, I can I can elaborate on that if you'd like. It, it's actually mandatory now. Um, and and given the, uh, uh, what we try to do is we try to go out, pick up the gear, bring it back to the people and have them pay us individually, mm -hmm. okay, or an association. If it's turned into the state, the costs get extreme and there are repercussions, you know, and they're held accountable um, for these, this lost gear. Our preference is to say, okay, hey, Joe, I picked up your pots, here they are. And we've done this all, our, all for years and years and years. We've always brought the pots in for people. It's just now that it's it's mandatory, and we need to you know we recover them if the if the people pay and take care of the the process, it's it's really not an issue. But if it goes to the state, then it becomes quite a more quite quite more expensive, and there are repercussions that could you know impound their uh their their, their permit you know until that 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 gear is recovered or re that gear is paid for so the, you know those kinds of repercussions are difficult for me to um you know to 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 support in some respects because i don't want to see someone get put out of business because they can't afford to, to pay for gear that is accidentally lost mm -hmm. it's the people that abuse the system and we call it wet storage where the where the pots are left in the water till the following year, that is problematic. Uh, so those are the things that you know you have to weigh those differences, and we try to be as uh, we try to support the fishermen the best we can because nobody wants to leave their gear there; it's too expensive, and we, we try to bring it back and help the other guys out. Yeah, I'm, I'm compelled. Not, thank you. I'm compelled to ask, we've got a few questions coming in and I have been given authority by our fearless leader, Anna, to go a little beyond five o'clock. So we'll, we're gonna do that. Um, this is from uh, Jill again. Dick, what percentage of fishermen would you say share your commitment to putting the health of the ocean on a par with their business sustainability? That's kind of a tough heat. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, I would, I would think that most of us are pretty concerned about that because in reality, you know, if the, if something happens to the environment and the, and the, and, and the, the product that we're focusing on is reduced, then our income is reduced. So, you know, realistically, we have to be conscious of trying to, fish as sustainably as possible. I think most of these guys think about that now. It's much more apparent to them. And I I have to say that they support trying to, you know, keep this thing, keep things operational and, and be as as environmentally conscious as possible. I really I really do believe the greater percentage are in that, you know, in that realm. Okay, and then another question for you, um, <laughs> which I will be delicate with, I guess. Um, what message do you have for commercial f fishermen from, uh, the questioner asked, from Asia, who, and they express that they don't think that they, these fishermen are as protective of the environment. Uh, please say that one more time, please. Basically, what message do you have for commercial fishermen from Asia? And then it was sort of finished <laughs> off with, uh, in, in this writer's belief that they're not as protective as the fishermen here. I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I think the bottom line is, is there, is there a, a message that you have for, for, for fishermen from other? I just would have to say, you know, think about the long term. You know, if you, if you just continue to, to abuse the system, sooner or later, it's going to break down. And, uh, you know, we need to think about the long term effects. And I think, uh, you know, we've done what we can or we're doing as much as we can to keep things sustainable. I mean, whether we're using barbless hooks, whether we're using breakaways on our lines, whether, you know, we're, we're thinking about, you know, retrieving gear. I think, the long, you know, it's the long term effect that we really need to pay attention to. You know, you know it's just yeah, I don't think they do. Sometimes I don't think that happens. I think it's like what I can do right now and how much can I get? Well, when I was assistant secretary, um, I wrote uh, Governor uh, 
Wilson's ocean uh, strategy, and I also wrote Governor Schwarzenegger's ocean strategy. But you know, my my mantra, which I really believe, is that uh, prudent and, and effective ocean management and protection is money in the bank. It, it is mm -hmm. is an economic investment. When we go into the beaches and we make them safe to swim and we deal, deal or manage with some of the shoreline erosion problems and people oftentimes are actually killed by cliffs landing on them and we have to manage these things. Uh, and, that, and that fish are still out in the oceans uh, and are available to people. That's what brings people to California. That's why we're an internationally known uh, place, a destination uh, because of this bounty that, that, that we have. And, uh, I think the biggest problem we would have is, is with people who had very short-term horizons uh, with regard to the way that they conducted themselves and their businesses. And uh, so, but it was it was very interesting when <clears throat> we actually did one of the first economic analyses uh, ever done of the impact of ocean-dependent industry in California and found out recreation and tourism, for example, is huge. And it, it, despite the fact that you are bringing in a sustainable product. A lot of tourists like to go up there and look at your boats and, and have that whole, <laughs> they do, they really do. It, it's, it, that's an industry. And, and yeah. so, and it should be recognized as such. And it's not in the millions of dollars, it's in the many, many billions of dollars. So, uh, so I, I think that that is, is something that I, I hope can be a kind of a mantra for us here in California and nationally and internationally. Um, and you know, thank you just so much for your, your, your leadership. Um, and, and Cynthia, uh, you know, I, I just think that this, this film, uh, again, it was just delightful for me to see it. My wife and I watched it the other night. I watched it for the second time and I watched it a third time just because there's, there's a lot of little things in there, little tidbits, but it's very, very well done. And it really moves the ball uh, forward. And, and David, uh, David, the thing about David, he's sort of like the Indiana Jones of all of you guys, because he is usually off in Malaysia somewhere. And one time uh, a few years back, he was on some pier somewhere on his kayak out in the middle of nowhere and fell through the pier and dislocated his shoulder and had to paddle like a long ways back with <laughs> quite injured but uh but you know david is out there uh really trying to to do the right thing and work with people and, and so forth and uh it's just I, I just think this is a wonderful thing yeah. brian can i just add a little bit sure uh, to what uh Dick was saying, and then also just answering that question, what would you say to Asian fishermen? Because we work in Asia three months out of the year, and I'd be there now if it wasn't for COVID. Um, one of the first things would probably buy U.S. seafood because we're better regulated and managed uh, and ask where your seafood comes from. Buy local if you can. Small fishermen are generally the most sustainable. But, you know, the, the movie touches on Seafood Watch with Monterey Aquarium. Sustainable. There's a whole sustainable seafood guide. Uh, over 70% of U.S. seafood is imported. And so, you know, eating less imported seafood, particularly harmful seafoods like shrimp that do a lot of damage from bycatch, shark fin. Um, and what, the, what we tell Asians is they need better regulation. And we work with governments in Malaysia, as you said, also Indonesia and now in China as well through education, hopefully the Ocean Film Festival in Chinese. Uh, to educate people and, and show them how incredible the ocean is. And it's, as Dick said, it's important for all of us. It's our life's blood, it's our future. And if we don't keep it alive, we're not gonna be around much longer. And I think this pandemic really emphasizes that, how small the world is and how important it is. We not tinker around too much with, with nature and it's gonna come back and bite us up like it is now. Thank you. I think that might be an appropriate closing thought. Anybody have any other uh, things you'd like to say. Uh, I, I thought this was really a great panel and uh, just delighted I could uh, be part of it. Any other thoughts from anybody? I think I would just like to add that it's not only the importance of the fishery, but the health of the ocean, because a lot of people don't know that over 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. And so it's every second breath we breathe comes from a healthy ocean and our health relies on a healthy ocean. So, and that includes the fisheries and our, whatever we do on land also affects Absolutely. what's in the ocean. And that's important to understand. That was the mantra of the 
Pete Wilson, uh, when we did that, that uh, strategy, it was, it was connecting the land activities to the ocean, the ocean. That's where most of the pollution comes from and the people come from there, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we're done. Dick probably wants to get out you know, fishing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I give I, a plug? I, 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 Brian? I need, I need to time off right now. You know, I'm recovering. Thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking of salmon, uh, the Ocean Film International Ocean Film Festival, San Francisco, we're doing uh, another one of these panels on Tuesday at four, this coming Tuesday on salmon, farm salmon in the film Artificial. We have Josh Murray, the filmmaker, and a Native American, Amy Cordalis, actually, who was involved. She's with the Yurok tribe. And I wasn't aware that you were a Native American, Dick, and, and that I know there's a lot of involvement in the uh, MPA and Sonoma with, with tribal nations. Uh, so anyway, if you want to learn more about farm salmon and why fresh salmon is so much better for you and the ocean, check out our, our uh, Tuesday at four in the International Ocean Film Festival. Look at the website. David, I have to clarify that. I'm, I'm actually Asian. Okay, not not native. Oh, American. I thought you I, didn't. You say uh, I thought there was something. No, no, no. My my I fished. I fished. Uh, you know, primarily in the beginning of my life uh, with my grandfather, who's a Ponca Indian ah. in Oklahoma. Okay. You know, yeah, but I am Oklahoma. I am an adopted uh, Japanese. Uh, ah, okay. American that was brought to the United States. Thank you, though. Well, that clarifies it for me too. When I when I read about the grandfather, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. With that going to uh, conclude the session. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Bye-bye.